the rest of the have. And, and he's got the next little bit. So Dr. Hughes, I'm going to be quiet until I get down to a 10 or 15 minute warning, but I'm going to give you your time. We're just uh, maybe three minutes behind, but we're in good shape right now. So Dr. Hughes, thank you, sir, for being here and helping us plan this as well. Uh, th thanks, uh, Troy, and thanks for pulling this together and to everybody else. Uh, I, I feel like the most valuable part really uh, is the part where uh, Phil Baggett, Mr. Phil Baggett and Dr. Osborne um, talk about their experiences with the program. Um, you know, there, there's nothing like showing that it can be done. Uh, what we're going to do here is is go through this uh, this toolkit. So hopefully, y'all were y'all were able to follow the instructions that I gave you verbally, and then are also in the chat uh, to to download the 2022 version of the value added producer grant toolkit. And we're going through the working capital uh, because that's what most people are interested in applying for. We have had some planning grants that have been successful in Tennessee, but it's it, we're like most other states. It's it's mostly uh, working capital. I will. I, I've had a request to try to, uh, when possible, show you where I am in the toolkit, which is like I said once again a Word document. Although I try to indicate in the PowerPoint what page we're on, and I'll do it with the little asterisk with the page number. So hopefully you'll be able to, to follow along because that is a key part of, of what we're doing here. Uh, so really uh, I cover all the points that, that are in the agenda, but really this is an attempt to show you the steps to submitting a strong package. So one that, that's, that's quote what I call legal and one that's strong enough to get funding. So of course being legal or eligible is the first step. Uh, you want to make sure that you're eligible. If you're not eligible, you could have the greatest idea in the world, and USDA Rural Development could be, you know, chomping at the bit to fund that project, but you're not eligible, they can't do it. So that's the first requirement. And then, of course, uh, getting those points and having that application to get all those points uh, where you do strong uh, score strong enough to to receive the uh, the, the 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 help. Okay, so the outline, why apply? We're gonna do an overview of the value-added producer grant application. We're gonna do project scoring. Chuck did a great job of that and, and also providing an overview. And this is just reinforcing that, okay? And then we'll do a summary. Okay, uh, so like I said, you can see there that asterisk indicates the page in the application template, that Word document, once again, using that print layout button down there at the bottom right middle button that we're using, and you want print layout, okay? It doesn't really make sense if you, if you don't use print layout. So nothing simple. Okay, the funding, why do you want it? Well, you know, to implement your dream, uh, you can test new ideas with less personal financial risk. Say if you're getting, uh, uh, you're putting in $200,000, but you're getting $200,000 under the VAG program, that really lowers your financial risk. And of course, that would increase your profitability. Um, the information you collect, I wouldn't only say may, it will prove useful regardless of whether you get the funding. Uh, it facilitates collaborations and it facilitates access to resources. So in your in this process, you might learn about other funding programs like TAEP, for example. Uh, I suspect that at least some of y'all that are in on this webinar weren't aware of that program until Will talked about it. So now you know. And by the way, that the advantage of TAEP is it's unlike this program, it's easy to apply for. Um, and it will cover equipment, but that being said, it's very popular, so uh, I would consider this program as well. Uh, this gives you an opportunity for evaluating your ideas and really thinking through them. Um, it also, if you haven't done it already, you should have done it already, but it forces you to develop a business plan and perhaps even a feasibility study, depending. Um, and, you know, ultimately it can 
you can use this to access or bill to other funds, other grants and, and loan programs. Although you have to be careful with all of that, like we said earlier. Um, where's value added producer grants gone? Um, and, and we used to have, I used to do more of what Chuck did with this and decided to eliminate it, but mostly not to Tennessee. Changing that is a reason for this training. We felt like we were really building some strong momentum until last year. We kind of fell off. Chuck talked about the reasons why, but we really want to see, you know, at least 10 to 15 applications come out of Tennessee that are strong enough to get funding. And that would put us in the same ballpark that typically states like Virginia and North Carolina get, which is where we want to be and really where we should be. Okay. Okay, this round. The total funding available for this round is currently unknown, at least it is to me. Uh, 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 Chuck probably has some ideas, but I don't, or an idea, but I don't think he can even talk about it yet. Uh, okay, you can uh, you can submit your applications two ways through to grants.gov and the link showed there. Um, and last year it was April 25th was the deadline. We'll think it'll be a similar deadline, but it depends on when the federal government releases the notification, the NOFA. And basically, after the NOFA is released, you have 90 days to apply. Uh, so we suspect the April 25th deadline for electronic application, it's not far off, but it's certainly we don't know. Uh, but better idea is to mail, or I would hand deliver it. And last year, you had May 2nd as the deadline. And so I would, uh, if you're if you're mailing it, it's gotta be postmarked by that May 2nd or whatever the deadline is. If you're hand delivered it, you gotta get to it before they close on the, on the second. We say hand delivering is best. Um, and, and I would hand deliver it to, to my local regional office. Uh, so, uh, you know, that, that map and the instructions that Chuck gave you uh, earlier, I'd use that as a guide as to where to go. Um, so that's the best approach. Even better yet, though, is for a few weeks in advance, get the, that local USDA rule or the state office, the USDA rule development office to review your draft application, okay? And, and talk to them if you're seriously considering an application. And, and there's their contact information, which Chuck's already provided. But you, in the past, I can't speak for them this year, but in the past, they'll go through it enough to at least make sure you're eligible, okay? So definitely talk to them uh, early, like, like, uh, like Phil Baggett pointed out. Uh, and like I said, the best contact is really that regional uh, office and Chuck has that information. Okay, we Chuck's covered the two types, the um, uh, the planning grant, the working capital grant, both require one-to-one -one match. If you apply for 125,000, you document $250,000 for the project. And we'll talk a little bit about that documentation toward the end, uh, but you're sourcing 125,000, okay? So you got a source, what you or or match what you what you apply for. Okay, planning grants. These are for applicants who haven't com completed the planning activities. It can fund feasibility studies, business plan, marketing plan. You can hire planners, lawyer, accountants, or other qualified consultants to complete the planning activities and related expenses. Feasibility studies a report by an independent third party that analyzes a business venture's prospects for itself, the success, and it lays out the features of the business plan and concrete, concrete, com, critiques them, analyzing strength and with, with weaknesses and provides an assessment of overall feasibility. It's usually for 12 months and it's 75,000. Um, now your feasibility study really is you know, if you get one and it says this isn't feasible, it's probably not very much useful to you. So you want to have a good, good enough idea uh, and enough organization to have something. If that consultant is looking at it, that they're going to say it's going to be feasible. So you got to put some work in it. 
I've done feasibility studies and I've done ones where I say, I think this is a great idea and all likelihood it'll move forward. I've done a number that says this will move forward if if uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten happen. That's kind of uh, in the middle. And then I've want, done ones where I've said, in all probability, we don't think this is a feasible idea. So you definitely want to really be in that first category uh, where the consultant says, we really feel like this is a strong plan if you do go this route. Working capital. Applicant must have completed planning activities. Business plan and for financial projections are required. There is an exception for the simplified version that's already been covered. And funds can go to marketing and advertising expense, like legal expenses of organizing the venture, designing the accounting system, implementing a marketing program, certain operating or processing costs, such as salaries and supplies, some inventory, can be up to 36 months, but as little as 12 months to spend. It's based on demonstrated project need, must show all grants and matching funds will be spent within those 36 months or the 12 to 36 months, however you, you indicate when you put down your beginning and end date, okay? And the cap on the money that you can get is 250,000 and Chuck showed that slide earlier. The average, I think was something around 170,000. This is the simplified working capital grants. I don't know if there are not many of these submitted, but they can be a feasibility study and business plan not required, but you miss, still must show increase in customer base and revenues as a result of your application. Um, and, you, and your cap is, is you got to be under 50,000 for the simplified working capital grants. Okay, so overview of the grant application projects. This is based on that application template. Use the template. Um, those are the instructions to go to it. We've gone through that, so I'm not going to walk us through that again. But you have seven sections. Uh, somebody indicated they wanted to see what this looked like. Uh, there it is. So you should have a document that looks like this. And when you page down, um, you'll see that that page number one, that page one there. If you're in the other views, you don't get that. And it's kind of important because I keep referring to page numbers. Okay, so as much as I can, I'll pull this thing over and, and try to show where we are uh, as we work our way through this presentation. Okay, first you gotta uh, uh, register for SAMS, there's a link. It's also a link on page one of the template. Um, that can take up uh, to 10 days. Uh, and you must go to grants.gov. I guess you uh, DUNS is no longer in, in place, but you do need the SAMs and the, and the IRS business numbers. And there's in grants.gov where you can go and, and register for the uh, for the I e e I N, uh, anything else that you need to do with that link. And that should be same day, but but the SAM should be, will could take up to 10 days. So if you're serious about this at all and you don't have a SAM's uh, number yet, so I would do that. The constant <laughs> fighting and shit not getting done. I would do that I'm immediately. Not I'm not saying it's your fault. What the issue is, is that like, we need somebody to make, make sure chance. about him. Need right? to make about him. I've been working. Need to make sure somebody about him mute me. their microphone. I've been working please. on laundry and dishes. Somebody needs to mute. Okay, I, I think they did. There's okay. A bunch of, like white. <laughs> need to make sure we're muted. Because like, she's bloated. Sure her stomach is exploded inside of her and pushing everything out any hole. Whoever's the host has Have the we... power to mute everyone. I think, did that do it? I think I muted him. Let me see. Okay. okay, good, thank you. Sorry. Um, okay, sorry about that, folks. Okay, so um, I, I think we've covered that. If you have questions about that, you can put it into the chat. Okay, so we're at the table of contents now. 
Um, and I'll briefly show you the table of contents here. So you're looking at the table of contents on my document. And the table of contents runs uh, two pages. And you get that weird thing where Word wants you to update it, even though you have no interest in doing so. But if you look at the table of contents, you'll see there are seven major sections. I'm just scrolling down to see that, you know, summary information, et cetera, et cetera. Number four, applicant eligibility, project eligibility, seven matching funds, and then various appendix tables, some of which we will talk about, uh, some of which we, we want. Uh, things like matching, though, are important. We'll talk about that. Uh, somebody's already asked about priority points. Like if you're a woman, a female owned business, do you get a priority point? Yes. But the thing about priority points, if you check one of these in general, you, you only need to check one. So if you're a veteran and you're a minority or female owned business, you don't have to check both. You can if you want, but you're only going to get one point, okay? Uh, even if you check both, if that makes sense. Okay, so there we're back to the slide. Um, and and there's our 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 seven uh, uh, sections that we talked about. Uh, you have required standard forms, and uh, you you need to fill out those form two forms. We're not really going to go into that. They're pretty simple. There's the link to those forms. Uh, FYI, uh, when I try to pull these up in Google, and maybe it's because I'm using go.go, I'm not sure, but anyway, it, it doesn't really work. I have to go to Firefox, or you might want to go to some other browser when you're pulling those up, just FYI. I, I've had issues with, with Google. Hey, David. Yeah. Uh, you can... You you can go on like usda.gov e form site probably and pull them off, but make sure when any, anybody's pulling forms that you get a current version of the form that's not expired, if possible. If you okay. have trouble finding one, reach out to your regional field staff and they can get them for you. Okay, good. Thank you, Chuck. You're welcome. Okay, so template, template summary information. Um, and now we're on page two. Okay, so summary information. Um, and so I'll show it real fast. But we're here. Okay, so this is what we're talking about here. But there you'll, you, you need that EIN number and that e, UEI number, which I guess is the replacement for the DUNS. And you should get that when you go through the application process. And also you'll put in your SAMs, your SAM or your CAGE code and the expiration date on that as well, okay? You'll have application type, independent producer, uh, uh, agricultural producer group, farmer or rancher cooperative, majority controlled producer based business. I guess that would be like an LLC. Most of you will will check independent producer. Um, and, and I'll assume that as I go through this process, although I will talk about other cases. Uh, your raw agricultural commodity. So if you're growing corn and adding value to that corn, or if you're local foods with that corn, you would put that in. And then your value added product would be, uh, say you're doing frozen vegetables, you would put that in. And in fact, I do that as an example. If you're local food, you would say, you know, with sweet corn, selling sweet corn, locally and i would put in in parentheses i would say in state in the state of tennessee if you're applying from tennessee or with 
within 400 miles of my of my location. You indicate uh, that it's a working capital grant, so you check that, and then you put the amount that you're going to apply for. Now, when you're doing that, I would write the amount I'm applying for down somewhere and put it on a sticky note and have that up there so whenever I'm going through this document, I would know that's the amount I'm applying for So, because you're going to be referring to that uh, 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 often, really. Your grant's starting date and ending date, uh, I would usually they announce the awards, Chuck, isn't it about in the fall, early fall, typically, say if you're implying in May, in May or August. Uh, but I would assume a date like September 1, a reasonable date, September 1, October 1, August 15th. Uh, and then based on how long I'm going to take to spend this money out, I would add in that ending date. So if I say I'm going to be done with this project that I'm applying for in two years, I would go two years from the starting date. If it's three years, I'd go three years and, and so on and so forth. Okay. Hey, and, David. Yeah. Hey, yeah, you you always want to show that start date October 1st. You always want okay. to, because we usually award in September. So you want it to be at the start of the new fiscal year. So, okay, the, gotcha. so like if it was October 1 to 23, you know, three years later would be your end date. Okay, so October 1st is what you'd want to use. And then just do one or two or three years out of that, depending. Um, so uh, the check of reserve funds, if applicable. Um, so if you apply for one of those, like you're a beginning farmer or rancher, and I think that's 15 years or 10. If you're socially disadvantaged farmer or rancher, so that if you're minority owned or woman owned, you check that. Um, and then middle tier, value, middle tier value chain projects, we're not talking about that, but that's somebody that's say amassing local foods and selling it, you know, sort of a food hub kind of project would probably a, 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 a qualify under there. For priority points, uh, check if applicable, that's that beginning farmer or rancher, veteran farmer or rancher, socially disadvantaged, small, cooperative, et cetera. Uh, but once again, you can check several boxes, but you know, you're only gonna score for one of the boxes, okay? Okay, so now we're at page three. Uh, and I'll go over here. And if you have whoever whoever provides whoever provides this application, whoever's your grant writer, fill that in. So if you're using somebody else, put their name in their in the name of their business. If it's you, put your name in and the name of your business. Okay. So that's pretty straightforward. Okay, section two. So we're now we're we're at um, uh, on page three still. The legal name, <coughs> excuse me. Yeah. <coughs> Under the executive summary, this is a more detailed description. You want the legal name of your applying entity, whether it's planning or working capital application applicant type the amount requested. So like I said earlier, write that down, use the same value, project summary, project, project goals, how you intend to use the grant funds. Okay, so you wanna summarize all that. If if I was writing one and I've applied, I don't apply for this and I'm sure I never will, but I've a, I've been on projects where I applied for a lot of grants, uh, you know, in my academic career, uh, either by myself or working with others. I would jot this down and then I would go through and do the rest of the application and then I would come back and and complete, you know, and edit my summary to make sure it's consistent with what I put with with everything else. OK. Uh, further into the application. OK, now we don't really need to look at the at the. Uh, template for a second. but. What's some examples of an executive summary? And somebody said that, uh, could you provide us one? I'm not sure we can do that, but 
and, and that's really up to Chuck with an example, but a, a fair amount of the burbage in here is stolen or taken from successful applications. So this would, and I might've changed something like a number, uh, but that would be it. So uh, creating marketing value-added products has the potential to significantly enhance our farmer's profitability. Our 125,000 in working capital funds. So what have, I, what have I said? I've said how much we're applying for. It's working capital funds. So I've checked those two boxes. We'll help pay for processing, marketing, distributing, and sales of our pasture-raised chicken and eggs, as well as microgreens that we know. So, you know, this indicates right there how much money we're asking for. It's working capital and what the money's gonna go to and, and what our marketing goal is really, right? What are we selling? Okay, so what we're selling, how we're selling it. Uh, so it, all of that is summed up in there. So that's a great kind of statement to have in your executive summary. Another one is our 125,000 in working capital funds will be used to pay labor costs. Okay, so we're saying what we're paying for, produce our artisan cheeses from organic milk, and for packaging, labeling, and, prom and promotional, and, and some detail, new website and product label expenses. Um, so there again, you're, you're talking about what you're doing, okay? How you're gonna spend that money, what your goals are, how it's gonna increase profitability, increase sales. Uh, so it achieves the project grow goals of goal, or goals of increasing sales and profits, and it shows how you intend to use funds. Okay, so those, those are several really good examples. Okay, um, eligibility requirements, uh, state your, your qualifications. So, so we're still in the summary, state, state the name of your four farm organization in the first sentence of the summary. Okay, and emphasize appropriate experience and training. So, you know, this is a completely made up example. And I used to use hemp and I got rid of hemp uh, because it's controversial, like uh, it's been pointed out. You can still apply for hemp, but, it, but basically if you're using the stalk or the seed, you're okay. If you're using the flower, you're not. Um, but Hannah and Harry and Hannah Jones, okay, owners of Tennessee Veggie Farm, are beginning farmers. Okay, there's my extra point. You know, I'm a beginning farmer and I check that beginning farmer uh, box. Am I qualified? Yeah, Harry is a former University of Florida Extension agent with 20 years experience. Hannah is a member of the US Angus Association and raised show cattle for 12 years. They started farming in 2012 and planted their first vegetable crop in 2015. They both have degrees in agriculture and resource economics in UT and have completed CPA value-added training. So this indicates to the reviewers that you're really qualified and know what you're doing, okay? So I would throw all that in into that, that first statement. Okay, general eligibility requirements. These are mostly a series of check boxes regarding grant eligibility and citizenship and other topics. And I guess I can show that real fast here. So there are your check boxes. So just read through those and get that. Okay, this is the, uh, came up, this came up before about multiple grant eligibility. Okay, you didn't get one in the prior year and you're not applying for one this year. Okay, now, like Chuck says, if you're a separate legal entity, you can apply. So, uh, you know, if I own a farm and my wife owns a farm and it's each under our name separately and she applies for one, I could apply for one. Okay, but, but there's special circumstances and I would definitely talk to USDA Rural Development before I proceeded if I had those. Um, so that's just more checkbox here. We won't go through all of that. Um, but you don't currently have unused VAPG funds. Uh, you know, you're not delinquent or anything like that. Um, 
and, and so on and so forth. Uh, if you if if you are like a winery, you definitely want to check that you know make indicate to that you do have your uh, your permits all in place. And there's a special uh, uh, notification with respect to hemp. Uh, if you are, you know, a, a, a hemp producer that would fit uh, with the with Chuck, what Chuck's already indicated. In other words, you're basically not shooting for the health or wellness market. You're shooting for a fiber uh, kind of use tip, really. Um, okay. Okay. So when you're doing this, remember to include an app in Appendix B materials uh, on page 24, your information regarding the legal standing. So you'd want to put in, for example, articles of incorporation. And if you're a sole proprietor or independent producer, you want to include a copy of your farm IRS document, your Schedule F showing farm income. Okay. Okay, so now we're at page five. So we're we're here on page five. So your application type, say if you're an independent producer, um and so on and so and so. If you apply as a harvester or whatever, you would you would be checking one of these boxes. If you're a ag production group, you would check that. And we're you know we're down to page seven there. Uh, if you're a farmer rancher or, or farmer or rancher cooperative, you check that box on on page eight. Okay. Oh, but but back to page to page five on the four point one. Uh, so you know we grow raise the subject agricultural commodity commodity through precipitation in the day to day labor management and field operations. So that's just you know we produce the raw product to be transformed through day to day field operations. That is your farmers. You want to check that. Um, we produce and own at least more than 50% of the raw input to be processed. So you want it to be 50.1% plus, okay? And so Chuck said earlier, if you're talking about processing 50 head of cattle, you'd want to provide 26, 26 of those cattle to yourself. You're not contract producers for others. You know, you're doing, you're raising your own crop, okay? And you main you maintain ownership throughout processing, so you own that meat, um, as, you know, or that that animal and the meat from that animal as it goes through that processing process. The it, the exception is that mid tier value chain, which we're really not going to get into that. So you're an independent producer. You produce participate in day to day labor management and field operations. Oops, sorry. Um, okay, so for example, you grow sweet corn by applying typical agricultural prof practices on a daily basis through the growing season, and you market a final crop that you own, okay? That would be an example of, of someone that would qualify. Okay, so now we're, we're on page nine. Like we said, we you know it's check boxes for all those other uh, uh, categories that we really aren't going to go to in too much detail. So now we're four point nine, four point three rather. This is, starts at the bottom of page nine and goes through page ten. Uh, raw commodity committed to the project, and my and you know obviously I have make up made up numbers, but we're going to be talking about. Uh, these boxes here, there at the bottom of page nine, those two boxes. 
and then the two boxes uh, that are at the top of page 10. Okay, so total quantity. Okay, so uh, I'm going to be processing 50,000 pounds of vegetables. And it needs to be realistic for the value added product. So if I'm putting in 50,000 pounds of vegetables, I'm going to come out with 45,000 pounds of processed vegetables. And that needs to be a realistic relationship. So if I put down 2,000 pounds of vegetables, and 50,000 pounds of the value added processed vegetable, you know, a reasonable person in USA rural development is going to look at that and go, those numbers don't line up. And so it's going to be a big problem for you. Okay, total quality, quantity that you grow, you need to indicate that. My example is 30,000 pounds vegetable. And what did I make sure I did there? I made sure that I covered that at least 50% plus number. So 30,000 divided by 50,000 is 60,000, 60%. And that'll be the last box per percentage you provide is the 60%. So you know you're in that 50% plus category. Uh, and that you got 20,000 uh, that was purchased or donate from others. So I'm getting 20,000 pounds of vegetables that I'm buying from my neighbors. It's less than 50% of what that raw material I'm running through. And I make sure that all these numbers add up, right? And they're they're consistent. And I think they are in this case. Okay, uh, product eligibility next. We're still on page 10. Uh, name the raw agricultural commodity you will be used for the input. Okay, so vegetables for Harry and Hannah, and you want to check that box there. Um, you know, produced in the US. Well, obviously, the majority of the raw has to come from yourself, and then name that value added product processed vegetables. Okay, so five, we're talking about 5.1 here, and just these, these two fill ins there. Okay, Chuck covered this as well. We're in section 5.2, product eligibility, value-added uh, agricultural product methodology. Uh, you know, we have change in physical state is one. Uh, we have produced in a manner that enhances the value of the agricultural product, like organic cat carrots or eggs produced from free-range chickens. Physical segregation, like if you're having a non-GMO corn and you got you demonstrate that you keep that separate from your G, your GMO corn, for example. Uh, and then the energy that Chuck talked about as well. And then locally produced agricultural food products, you're selling in state or within 400 miles, okay? So, but most of these are changing physical state. Okay, so most of these, pulling this back over on page 10, you check that box there. And also down below there, you'd explain what you're doing. Okay, like I said, very important section. You want to indicate at least one, we're doing change in physical state. You want to, but when you're doing that in that explanation there on the bottom of page 10, you want to explain the process in some detail, okay? And so this is my not very knowledgeable example, just made up, but you want it at this kind of detail. The process for generating frozen vegetables from vegetables is well established and currently legal in Tennessee, and I'd say all other states. It's both legally and technically feasible. First, you, and then you go into some detail. First, you must feed, fill pack the vegetables after harvest. Second, the vegetables will run through a water line for cleaning and so on and so forth. So you'd lay out in pretty simple fashion as tersely as you can, but making sure you've indicated what you're doing uh, when you when you take that raw agricultural product and turn it into your to your final uh, value added process product. Okay. Um, we'll talk a little about about some of the other ones. Chuck this did this as well. Um, 
you know, the non-standard method, usually that's an organic crop, but this is key and I'm not sure he, he covered this, um, but you would need to demonstrate with price data, for example, with organic crop, that you actually are adding value. If, you, if you're producing organic crop and you end up selling that at a lower price than a norm nine organic crop, you really aren't adding value. So you have to show that you're adding value. So if you are gonna go organic, be sure to find some, some sort of price data that indicates you are adding value that'll show that organic products for what you're doing, for what you're making like carrots, usually receive a higher price than conventionally grown products. Okay, so you can, and, and, you know, and there's an example that I pulled from the literature, okay? A good place to go to get this kind of information if you wanna go the academic route is Google Scholar, just going into Google and Google, Google, Google Scholar, and then use Google Scholar to do your search because it will do a very good job of searching academic literature. And in fact, that's what I did when I found this uh, article from Applied Economics. Okay, the physical segregation, non-GMO corn separated from GMO corn, and the renewable energy must have a primary crop input such as dairy, manure, methane, electricity. So you can't you can't pay for solar panels with this, right? Because it's not a an agricultural input. If you're interested in solar, apply for uh, Re Rural Energy for America program. We're having a webinar on that uh, next week on the 30th, if you're interested. And then locally produced agricultural food products. You got to demonstrate that it will be sold in local food markets in state uh, or within 400 miles and demonstrate local outputs, such as farmers markets or local demand. Uh, so this gets into the proving the point kind of idea. Uh, that Chuck talked about earlier. You you got to demonstrate that, and you'll have to demonstrate that later on uh, in the uh, discussion. Okay, so now we're on page twelve. Uh, still on section or section 5.3, expansion of customer base and increased revenues derived from the value added process. So you must cite one or more relevant sources to support the response statement and data below. And responses must be supported by project specific analysis, such as a feasibility study, marketing plan or business plan developed for the project and included with this application or for working capital applications that do not require a business, a feasibility plan study or business plan. You must identify a relevant authority source or independent basis for the data that you do provide. And so I tried to do that earlier when I had that citation. So that's where things like Google Scholar or or real help. So let's let's go into that more. So now we're here discussing the estimated ex expansion of customer base resulting from your value added product. Um, and so you need a baseline of current revenues from the sale of the agricultural value added product and an increased target number of increased revenues that will result from the project. So that's a mouthful, but basically it's saying you have to demonstrate more revenue. Um, you have to demonstrate more customers, expanded customer, increased revenue, more customers. So you talk about going from a baseline to a target in terms of increased number of customers that will result from this project. So everything is result from the project. And then number three under that, um, you must include a description of the direct or indirect producer or food business benefits that would result from the project within a reasonable time after 
the money is received and, and spent. Okay, so let's, th this is all a mouthful. Hopefully it makes more sense. We'll look at some examples. So describe the benefits examples, okay? The direct producer benefits include increased sales, revenue, profit, and growth. We expect to see an impact on, on valued customer growth and sales within four months a grant award extending indefinitely. Independent, indirect benefits includes, includes increased jobs, taxes paid, and demand for grapes. So obviously this is a grape example. Grapes growing and establishing and the establishment of wineries are also keeping helping to diversify local economies, keep land and agricultural production as some crops become less viable. So that's an indirect benefit that I've stated. That's another indirect benefit that I've stated, the increased jobs, taxes paid, and demand for grapes. And by the way, I just did some analysis or was involved in some analysis on taxes that wineries pay in Tennessee, and it's a lot. Um, so they're not making it up. But this is an example from a winery um, and I think this actually did come from a successful application that described these benefits. Okay, so you want language like that. And if I was doing it, I would go in and say, you know, am I stating direct benefits? Am I saying when? And am I stating indirect benefits? So 5.4 now, we'll, we'll go back to some of the other points uh, in a little bit when we get into uh, the different types. But 5.4 now, um, still on page 12, your checkbox, uh, you want to check that it's, that it's you know, working capital, that you didn't improve. So it's just a series of, of checkbox there. Okay, so types of working capital applications. There are two types, and I think now we're uh, on the next page, page 13, but there are two types, and that this gets important in terms of how it affects your application. Uh, there's emerging market and their market expansion. Basically, the uh, reporting requirements or the proof requirements, rather, is a better way to say it, in your application or more strict for emerging markets than for market expansion. And you'll see what hopefully I mean in a few minutes. So emerging market uh, demonstrate the grant and matching funds on a new product and or new ge geography or demographic markets for us, okay? Not in general, but for what we're doing, okay? So you wanna check, we have not supplied the proposed product, geographic or demographic market for more than two years at the time of application. So if we haven't done it at all, or if we've done it for less than two years, then we're emerging markets. Okay, if you're emerging markets, by and large, you have to include a feasibility study and a business plan, okay? Uh, so you can't just provide a feasibility study that's done by a third party. You also have to provide a business plan, which you can do yourself. And actually, I remember a producer in Tennessee uh, who had a good feasibility study, but they didn't realize that for emerging market, they also needed a business plan. So they had to cobble together or get someone to cobble together a business plan for them real fast, okay? You'll need to indicate the person, the name of the person completed and the date for the feasibility study and for the business plan. So like I said, that feasibility study and business plan, um, uh, it you know is an important requirement for emerging markets, uh, and you you know you got to outline what you're doing for your venture in in both of those documents. 
So what's a feasibility study? It's a document that indicates the feasibility of what you're doing, uh, the background of it. So you want a section on background. You want a section on market analysis. So who you're selling to, uh, basically uh, your site, your layout, and your facilities that are required, um, your plant and equipment, your cost structure, um, like if it's a winery, your vats and everything, your aging tanks, uh, your building that you're in, uh, your staff, you know, how many people are you going to hire, what kind of activities they're going to have, basically what they'll get paid, a production and marketing plan, how you're going to make and sell this, and then a financial plan. So, you know, cash flow statements and, and uh, you know, capital use ratios and all those kind of numbers need to be in there. So you need both of these uh, for that emerging market. You need that feasibility study and you need that business plan. Okay, if you check market expansion, uh, now you're, you're in the market, but you're selling to new customers. Okay, so it's an, it's an easier activity here. You don't need a feasibility study. You, you still need a business plan or a marketing plan. So you got to demonstrate that the focus is on new customers and that this activity will bring in new customers uh, with uh, additional revenue and of course profits for you, okay? Market expansion, the, like I said, the feasibility study is not required. I guess you could do a feasibility study and not do a business or marketing plan, but people typically just do a business plan or a marketing plan. So really, you probably just want to do these and you should have a good business plan and really a good business plan already, a good marketing plan already. So what's an example to have to do when you're doing this, okay? You want to indicate more revenue and more customers. So you want to cite industry reports, academic studies, or your own records to support. So for example, uh, Industry studies. Uh, somebody's talking in the background. Industry studies, uh, Pepper 2020. So I have that citation listed, and I'll actually have the reference in my documentation. Indicates the demand for frozen vegetables has grown by such and such since you know 2018. And it's projected to grow to such and such by 2025. That's as evidence that you know if I do get this money, it will lead lead to growth. There's growing demand out there uh, based on national data, and you can extrapolate and all that. We es the estimate the number of Tennessee customers using our frozen vegetables will grow from 2,000 from a base of zero. Really, should be base of 1,000, say based on our estimated level of production and projected demand growth, leading to at least 99,000 in revenue from a given base, based on projected production of 45,000 pounds at $2.22. So notice, I think I at least did my calculations here where they're consistent with the 99,000, okay? Okay, so that should give you an idea of what you need in terms of more revenue, more customer sort of example. Okay, so now that gets us to page 14. So this is work plan and budget. So if you want to look on that template, this is where we are right here, the work plan and budget right there. So your grant eligibility period is up to 36 months from your starting date, which like Chuck said, you want to make October 1. Uh, 
but it needs to, to begin within 90 days of the date of the award. You want a clear and concise budget. Um, so you don't, for example, you won't didn't you wouldn't want to put January of 2024 because that'd be past the 90 days most likely. You want a clear and concise budget, and you want to tie project activities to the budget. Okay, so. What do you want to do? You want to describe how eligible activities will go to meet to meeting project goals. You want to show budget allocation for eligible activities. You identify key personnel for conducting or receive, overseeing activities. Provide a time frame for those activities. Show how grant and matching funds are used to support activities and a grant period timeline meeting starting and any date requirements. Okay, you wanna show all of that when you're doing this. And this might be a place, and Chuck can interrupt me or can correct me later, but when you're talking about key personnel and their qualifications, you could throw that in here. Like, you know, we're gonna hire a computer program and programmer and that programmer will, you know, need to do ABC and have these certain re, uh, abilities and certifications to do what we're talking about, okay? So put in detail, detail, detail. That's what this is all about. Okay, now what are we talking about in terms of this, uh, this toolkit, but we're talking about this information here, oops. You know, under project summary, where it summarizes the tax, and, and this should be, uh, you know, expandable. And then you'll want to do it for the individual activities, which are broken down here, okay? The personnel, the fringe benefits, and, and all of that, you know, travel equipment, et cetera. Uh, so you'll want to do one of these for each. Uh, task breakdown okay and so we'll we'll look at we'll look at some examples here in my slide which hopefully make make some sense to you okay uh your web page key personal activities meeting goals okay so this is an this is an example of a task so we're going to do a web page. The web page is designed to enhance frozen vegetable cells will be constructed by Dr. Jane Smith for sales, for sales growth of frozen vegetables. And Harry Jones will oversee the activity. Okay. And an advertising firm will, and so that's a task, an advertising firm will be hired to market frozen vegetables, hence facility market growth, Hannah Jones is going to oversee that activity, okay? So this indicates how we're going to meet this, this goal of increasing our sales, right? It indicates what we're going to do. We're going to do two things. We're going to put up a web page, and we're going to hire an advertising firm. And I would put in, um, if I didn't even have one, I would put an example. For example, um, uh, Troy Duggar's advertising as us would be a firm we might hire if Troy's actually got an advertising firm, okay? You don't necessarily have to have them lined up, but it would probably be a good idea if you did because then they could give you a letter of commitment there. Uh, but, you know, Dr. James Smith, you want a letter from Jane indicating she's going to do this. She would talk about how qualified she is to do it. So you're talking about who's doing it, she's qualified to do it, what's she doing, you know, it's gonna, how it's gonna benefit the project and who's overseeing it on our side. Harry's overseeing that. Similarly here, Hannah's overseeing that. Okay, then you talk about in these budget sheets on the task and overall, how that money's spent um, you know, starting and ending dates, 
if it's VAPG funds, if it's catch matching funds, or if it's in kind matching funds. Okay. So, how are we going to spend this? Well, 5,000 will go to uh, Dr. Smith for the new website, and the advertising firm will be paid $10,000 for its marketing activities, like advertising in an industry magazine, for example. So, as much as detail as you have on that that you can put in, I would put in. Okay, so when were we going to start that? Uh, May 1, we're going to start initiating the meeting with Dr. Smith regarding web page design. June 1, we'll do a follow up meeting. August 1 of 2023, I'll get a draft version. Okay, and so you want to fill that out in your, in your forms. So think through that work plan. You know, time, who, action, like we just talked about. You know, who over, who's doing it, who's involved in doing it. Uh, Smith's going to, you know, uh, Jones, both the Joneses meet with Dr. Smith here and get the process going. Then Smith goes and does his thing, for example, over the time period is indicated. And then finally, you know, it's produced. So when does it start? When does it end? And how's that money spent? I know it doesn't necessarily match the what we just had, but say if you were giving Smith um, 25,000, okay, 12,500. Or if you, or rather, if you had twenty five thousand in project costs, twelve thousand five hundred would be value to producer grant money. That would probably go directly to Smith. Uh, you'd have cash match, uh, which could probably go directly to Smith, and then the ten thousand would be in time kind, and that would be your time and effort that you put into that particular web website development yourself. So if you spent time working on that and you could justify your time spent with an hourly rate that Chuck talked that, uh, that Chuck talked about, that would be your your in kind match. But you definitely got to justify that, you know. And then you have your totals there, and, and so on and so forth. So you got to do that for a summary budget for each task. And so here's just an example. You know, if there's some some travel that would be included, you know, cash matches travel. Say if you spent five hundred dollars of cash on travel, that would be your cash match. And these need to all total up, and the match needs to equal up with the value to producer grants that are spent one to one. And I and I think we try to do that there. So these two totals here. The cash and then into kind should equal the the uh, VAPG money spent. So you got to provide a budget for each major task. Hey, Dr. Hughes, since you're on that point right there, do you mind? Uh, one question came in quickly. The so the VAP the the, the valuated funds is the grant total dollars requested on this chart on page 15. You're talking about? Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what you're going to what I'm pointing to here is what you're going to charge uh, to the grant itself. So that's what you're going to charge to the money that's coming in. And what you'll do is you'll spend that money and then you'll you'll send in a receipt to the to uh, to rural development and they'll reimburse you. Correct, Chuck? Is you have to show that you, as long as you spend an equal amount of matching funds, then yeah, right, we can. right. So you need to demonstrate both of them. All right, thank you, sir. I'm yeah, gonna give you a 15 you. minute. I'm gonna give you a 15 minute warning too while I'm letting in on. Okay, you. I'll try to. <laughs> thank you, sir. This is a lot to cover. So... I understand. You do what you need to do. Yeah. Okay, so now we're on page 16. Um, program income. So we're here. So gross income expected to be generated by project activities during the grant period, minus the cost. Uh, related that and estimated program income as a net. Now, Chuck, you said you want that to be zero. Is that right? It doesn't have to be, but but. People need to understand that if you do report program income 
and it's going to be deducted off of your remaining grant funds at that point. You know, because basically, if you're earning income from the grant, then you don't actually need as much grant funds. Okay. So it's not so too difficult to show that you don't have any program income. I mean, so there's do, plenty of expenses you can So pay. on my slide, I would make expected, I would either up my spending to 99000 or cut my expected gross income to 80000 So that would be a zero there. And yeah. I, I'm running off of a PDF version or I'd change it right now. I didn't think I'd have to make any changes. So uh, if you get this, just mark it through. Okay, now quickly we're gonna to try to go through some some evaluation criteria because I know where my time's running out. But nature of the proposal, qualifications of your personnel. Chuck talked about that and how important it is and how that's missed a lot. Commitment and support, work plan and budget priority points if applicable. Okay, number of jobs generated or saved. You gotta it discuss how this is done. So uh, the increased production in sales of 25% auto annually over the three year period of the grant uh, at the vegetable operation is expected to create and or save five full-time equivalent and 100% increase in current staffing. So you need to tie that back to your work plans and everywhere else to demonstrate that you are creating employment. Um, then you just, it, you know, that's the next part to fill in your current baseline of customers, which would be consistent, what you've already said, how many you expect. I think we said we expect 2000 more, your current revenue and increase, increases in revenue as a result of this activity. That also needs to be filled in and make sure that's consistent with what else you have in the grant. So if I put down 20,000 here, I would do a search on 20,000 in this as a Word document and make sure that I have 20,000, you know, as my increase in revenue everywhere revenue parks up, pops up. So that's just a, a, a trick that works for me anyway. Okay, so at least one performance evaluation criteria, working capital is a project serving targeted customers. You know, have you met, will you meet those increased uh, revenue? You have to demonstrate that. And if there are any special topics like meeting local food needs and for planning has a project return on investment been estimated and have you done the feasibility work? And that's at the bottom of page 17. Some examples, you know, we would say that we, you know, we're, we're, we're going to have new Tennessee customers. We expect 2,000 new customers. We expect 100,000 increase in revenue. And this needs to all be consistent with what we already said. So once again, I do a search on that 2,000. And I do a search on that 100,000. In effect, I think I put down 99,000 earlier, so I'm not being consistent, but you can, okay? This is, we mentioned this before, Chuck went through this, but this is how the scoring is done. You need, have to have a minimum of 50 points. Uh, the nature of the proposed venture the most you can get in 30 points is very important. Work plan and budget, 20 points is very important. But qualification of project personnel is also very important. That's 20%. And as, and as Chuck pointed out, a lot of times people miss this because they're going to hire somebody and they don't talk about the qualifications that that person are going to hire. So don't make that mistake. Um, fill in, you know, over discuss as opposed to discussing too little. Okay, nature of the proposed, uh, uh, the proprietor, uh, rather the priority, priority points is those 
categories we talked about earlier, uh, you only need to be in one of those though, okay? Like a beginning farmer or socially, historically socially disadvantaged. Nature of the proposed venture, you can get up to 30 points. Clearly describe your goal, support the goals with published data or third, or the third party information. Prior experience is helpful and experience with similar markets or successful ventures is helpful. So the tech, is it technically feasible? You wanna discuss that? Is it operationally feasible? Uh, you know, provide information and data on that. Talk about how you're going to actually do this, and you you might want to mention some risk and how you're going to deal with those that you anticipate. And this is where you get into that third party information, like from Google Scholar or wherever an industry site indicating it would be profitable, and it's economic sustainability. Um, so. Expected future viability described known risk factors and what might be required as the same future efforts. Okay, so you'd want to talk about all of that. Hey, David. Yeah. I just wanted to point out, reiterate on those third party references. Um, it, it's really important to make sure that you include, include those. That's another place that we see people yeah. consistently lose points. Yeah, that's that's why I made such a tried to make such a big deal about going to something like Google Scholar or an industry publication. So use the web or talk to a local expert like your local extension agent and and get their help. Um, you know, where you can get sources of information from other people that back up what you're doing. And it doesn't necessarily have to, you know, it's not gonna always write directly to your project, but just in general. OK, like I did with my example, you know, I cited that organic carrots get more a higher price in general. That's that's fine. You know, I don't have to show mine do necessarily. OK, so. You know, if you do all of that, you know, well, you address all the criteria, you have that third party information and you have a bibliography. So just don't say. Uh, you know, Hal Pepper said this, you know, in 2020 in a document, and then don't put the bibliography where he actually said it, okay, in the document. And it shows a high likelihood of success, then you'll grab those 30 points or close to it. Uh, qualification of project personnel. Uh, you know, you want to identify everybody responsible for, for managing and performing a work task, including a summary of qualifications and expertise, like I tried to do earlier. Describe their role, responsibles, commitment, responsibilities, commitment, availability, like I tried to do earlier, their education levels, their past professional experience, their relatively training, and especially want to include items indicating agricultural experience. So that's why I threw in all that information at the very first about Harry and Hannah's uh, qualifications. So, you know, if it's, if it's strong, you'll get those 15 to 20 points and letters of support. You want to include those in, the, in your appendix C. Okay, so if you've hired Dr. Smith to do something, then get a letter saying that they're going to do it, you know, how they're going to do it, et cetera. Commitment and support. This is also important, nine to 10 points. This is on page 19 and 20. You know, if you're several producers, so if you and your wife, you want to make sure that's in there, so you'll get your two points. Your end user, who you're going to, um, sell this to you want a letter from them indicating that they will they bought this in the past and it was a great product but they're going to buy it in the future okay you want to definitely get that in there they're going to buy it in the future um so third party providers like if they're providing your help their willingness to do this why they're qualified to do it and you really need to highlight their qualifications in the proposal so as you're writing your proposal be sure you make sure you highlight 
the qualifications of people that you are hiring, uh, uh, you know, is and that hiring supported by this act, this uh, proposal. Okay, uh, commitment. If it's all in kind match, you get one point. If it's cash match and in kind, you get two. If it's all cash, you get three points. Most people can't afford all cash, and so they'll do both, but they'll put in, you know, put in $500 or even $100, and then you get the two points in terms of cash match. So, you know, if you've, you've met all these points here, I think I'm running out of time, so I won't go through this, and then you'll, you'll strong squirrely here. Work plan and budget, a clear, comprehensive work plan, all project tasks, timeline costs and responsibility persons in a logical and realistic manner, and you're showing a high likelihood of success. So when I did that work plan budget sheet, that's what I was trying to do, okay? Okay, uh, you can get extra points awarded by rural development uh, if you're in an area that improves that really meets poverty goals, um, or if you check one of these five budget support areas. Um, matching is real important, and I'll just, it's important, but I'm running out of time. But be sure you got to verify your matching funds. You know, if you have, if it's cash match, you have to indicate that it's in this bank account, we have the cash match. Uh, if you're using a loan or a line of credit as a cash mat, that has to be in there and the lender must sign that letter. Verification of in-kind, the nature of your donated goods and services and how used, you got to justify that. When goods and services will be donated at a special time, you or your family members, your time can't be over 25%. And you must go through seven steps for five members of others to justify it. It's got to be one to one, and it's better to err on the side of conservative rather than to seek every penny as a match. Um, you're in kind, the same criteria for matches for spending of funds. If it's disallowed as an expenditure, you can't use this as a match. So your infrastructure or your machinery is generally not an in kind match. Uh, and it's good to have a portion as a cash match. You get those extra points. But if it's a, a if it's legal as an it's a subsidized expenditure, then it's legal as a match. So if you're under if it's a piece of equipment and you're under that five thousand, it's considered supplies. Then it can be used as a as a match. Matching funds can't come from other federal grants. I guess they could come from state, but I'd be very careful with that. I would probably not do that. You can't got to use market rates like Chuck said. You don't don't overvalue like if you're using a church hall for meeting space, that's usually free, so you can't put a dollar amount on it. You have to show that it usually costs something. Um, you can donate your time or someone else's like if a somebody a feasibility study provides extra work, this they're not paid for, that's a match. But if you're if you're Valuing services, you must document that rate, what the service provider normally re receives, or defer to an IRS set standard for the service. So if somebody's uh, being a broker for you on something, you, you might get what they get, their, their value per hour where it's documented, or go to what the IRS says it typically is. A working capital, raw material can be used as a match. So you can use your own crops that you grew. For example, for a cidery, the value added of the apples that you grew, not somebody else's, but you grew, could be used as a match. Um, priority points, check one if eligible. So be sure to check one of these. And if you fall into certain categories, there are reserve funds that you might get. Um, for Tennessee, um, <clears throat> Tennessee, 10% 10 of reserve funds are set aside for persistent poverty counties. 
And that is the persistent poverty counties in Tennessee. That's a determination that's done by the Economic Research Service, which is a branch of uh, USDA. So it's not the same as the distressed and at risk counties that Will talked about earlier. And there's my link to that same data set. Um, actually, now we're down to around 11 or 10 distress. So I don't know if you were distressed and you're not distressed now, how that would work, but you, it doesn't apply for this grant anyway, but it might for Will's. I would talk to Will about that though. For example, I think, uh, uh, well, Hancock's still on it, but Hardeman County, I think, was on the distress list, and now it's on the at-risk list. So start early, do your registration now, contact your rural development office now in Tennessee, use the template. It's a lot of work, but it's worth the effort. Okay, with that, I'm, I'm done with with my part of the program. Thank you, Dr. Hughes. That's a, that is great. A lot, lot to get through. And appreciate you doing doing that for us and, and bringing all that that information to our attention. And, and um, I, yes, sir. And yeah, I hope I didn't confuse people. You know, I ran through a lot, but just the more you look at it and stare at it, the more sense it's going to make to you. But like. Uh, you know, the people that's have been successful, break it down into separate said, break it down into separate task. And then it then it's, you know, a lot more doable. Sure. Thank you, sir. Um, a lot of information to go through again. Thank you for doing that. And and uh, you hang around a little bit with us too. We'll have some questions sure. time in, in just a few few minutes.